So oh, here we go. Um, we were talking about these last time when the bell rang, I believe. Um, oxytocin is used in is in pregnancy um, for making milk, for breastfeeding, and for uterine contractions. And it also helps with infant mother bonding. Vasopressin is also known as an antidiuretic um, because its action reduces the volume of urine output. It also raises blood pressure, and that's where they use it in um, medical. So if somebody's got really low blood pressure and passing out and doing stuff like that, they might use a vasopressin. Okay, and that sort of goes through the urine contracting, blah, blah, blah. Yes. <laughs> It's, it's part of the oxytocin. Um, I think I've got a little bit more on that, um, but it helps with um, the mothering instinct kind of thing is what they call it. Um, so a lot of people, it, it, acts, it helps with the hormone and, and helps with that bonding process. Um, oftentimes people call baby blues. It's not enough oxytocin because what happens is they haven't got that, and so now they get the baby blues is what it's called, and, and they don't make that bonding with the baby, and they don't really care about it. Okay. Um, so small, te small peptides are what we call neurotransmitters. Um, these are enkephalins. I don't know how to say that. Um, they are, you ever got that high when you exercise and you're like, oh yeah, I got to do some more, it's awesome. But when you first start, it's like, oh crap, I got to go exercise. But then you get going, it's like, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Okay, that's known as a, as a runner's high. Um, and it basically hits the same site as morphine and codeine does. So it gives you that extra high. Um, and there's two ones down at the bottom. What is different about the two? The very last, I, I like this, this uh, chapter. One of these things is not like the other. Okay, you guys remember that from Sesame Street way back when? <laughs> Go find it and watch that. You missed out, buddy. All right. You missed out, buddy. So these are different um, things that we'll be talking about. But the big thing is that they bind to the same receptor site. So what morphine and codeine do is give us that high, and these also bind to those sub sites and give us that, um, that high. Um, as we're looking at this next one, it's present in high levels in most cells. It re is a regulator of oxidation, oxidation and reduction reactions, and that's going to be important because as we look at oxidation and reduction, we're getting rid of and adding on hydrogens. Um, it um, protects cellular contents from oxidizing agents such as peroxides and superoxides where we can have some um, DNA damage. Um, this is a little bit different where it's, it's bonded through a side chain rather than through the peptide bond. So that's sort of an interesting thing there. And you can, you can see the um, acid down here. So, all right. So, simple proteins. As we're looking at a simple protein, basically we're still going to have our amino acid, which we've got here, and it's going to be bound by, and, it, and I know this is going to get in your head over and over and over again, it's going to be bound by peptide bonds. Tell me what a peptide bond is. Colby, say it again. Oh, you don't remember. Oh, okay. Okay, Carlin. NC double bond O, okay, which is known as what kind of bond besides a peptide? We learned about it before this. An amide. Okay, so between the amide bonds. Now, if I replace this R right here with an H, this is a, is a trick question, not really. You need to be learning them. If I replace that R with an H, what amino acid do I have? Not with an A. Mm -mm. With G. Yep. Okay, so I'm going to be quiz. By the way, when I get the quizzes up, they'll probably be quizzing you on these because you do need to know these backwards and forwards. 
Okay, so examples of peptides in, or proteins or hormones. Um, the book that we have, the Stoker book, doesn't have a real nice one as far as um, a table. So what I want you to do right now is run over underneath the microwave and grab out the other book so you have it. And if you haven't brought the other Stoker book, grab one of those too. Because we're going to be using those back and forth as we talk about different things here. So I like one book for one thing, and I like the other book for another thing. Uh, okay. We're missing two, so we don't need ten. Eight. Eight. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, go to page 633. I want you there really quickly in the Seeger Slaybaugh book. Oh, how did you, how do you rate? Okay, I want you to look at the table, 19.2. Tell me what's going on there. What, what things are protein peptides used for? Protein hormones. No, this is not the magical page. Bodily functions, okay. Like, sorry, I'm getting hot. Okay, renal hormones. What are renal hormones? What, are, what is a renal? What does that have to do with the body? Where, where is renal? Head, toes, feet, what? Kidneys. Renal. Okay, renal is kidneys. Okay, if you notice up here, we have adrenal glands, kind of stuff going on. Okay, let's go on a little bit more here. Um, I want you to look and I want you to do some pear share for the next little few minutes. I'm going to take a little break here. I want you to quiz back and forth what does this, see if you can go back and forth. Okay, you have the book open, but I want you to become familiar with this table. Okay, I'm going to pause the video. So here we go again. So we had some time when we talked about some different structures of protein hormones that you can do. Lots of things happen. Um, insulin is a protein hormone. Glucagon, which is also in um, working with your sugars, is a protein hormone. HGA is a, horm uh, is a hormone. So going forward, come on, we're going forward. There we go. So if we look at the characteristics of proteins compared to different things, an atom is 0.1 nanometers. And as we go up, protein is just below um, 10 nanometers. And lipids are a little bit below that. And if you look at a buckyball, remember when we talked about buckyball in general chem? That's 60 carbons in a, in a circle. It looks like a, a soccer ball and you put a carbon at each corner of the soccer ball area, pentagons and, and hexagons. That's actually one nanometer. So if you think of that, and it's actually 9 or 10 of those. Um, in, in width. So we're down in the electron microscope area. And as we get up to the flu virus and mitochondria and bacteria, we're even bigger. And then red blood cells and animal cells and plant cells, and you sort of see what's going on here. Go ahead. It's all right. No, back one. Micrometer. Micrometer. Mm -hmm. 10 to the minus 6. It looks like a U, but it's a micro. It's like a fancy M. Okay, so in the Stoker book, we're going to take another break real quick, and I want you really fast to find these. Yes? Because those bacteria are heat tolerant. There are some in the Great Salt Lake that are salt tol tolerant. So bacteria can grow to be tolerant of different things. That's the problem they're having with like MRSA um, and stuff in the hospitals because now they're getting bigger and better bacteria and viruses because they're becoming resistant to what we're using. Some of them are. Some of them are just damaged. And because they're damaged, then they adapt. 
Okay, I'm gonna give you a few minutes, I'm gonna pause the video. Okay, we're going forward. So, a primary structure of a protein. Um, we have an amino sequence. It's a precise se sequence that is determined by genes. And changing one of the amino acids in the sequence changes the entire protein. These polypeptides are between 50 and 1,000 amino acids in length. And the R group of the amino acids um, aid in shaping the protein. And as we go and talk about the R groups, we're going to talk about the different things that they can do to shape the proteins. Okay. No. They do have to be in a very specific order. If they're not in a specific order, then they lose their purpose. Okay, so a secondary structure, we get a little bit more stuff going on. Um, you can have a beta plated, sh plated sheet, or you could have an alpha helix. Alpha helix, you probably have already heard of. What do you know that is alpha helix? DNA. DNA. Okay, beta pleated is, um, it actually looks like a pleated piece of paper. So if you folded a piece of paper to make a fan, that's beta pleated. And this is all due to hydrogen bonding. So tell me, what can hydrogen bond? What three elements on periodic table will hydrogen bond and why to what? There's three elements that you have to have, one of these three elements, in order to hydrogen bond. Hydrogen and oxygen, or hydrogen and nitrogen, or hydrogen and fluorine. NOF, ni nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. It's top of the P. Nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. You have to have those directly connected to a hydrogen in order to hydrogen bond. Okay? So if we look here, we've got a nitrogen and a hydrogen. And that can hydrogen bond to this oxygen right here. Okay, if we look, um, it's also right here. Okay, most oftentimes it's the nitrogen and the oxygen. Why wouldn't in biological compounds, why wouldn't it be fluorine? Why wouldn't we get hydrogen bonding with hydrogen and fluorine? It's not cool. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right. It only wants one bond. Fluorine only wants one bond. It only wants one electron, and yeah, it's tough if you don't get mine, right? Or if I don't take yours. Um, so yeah, it, it only has one. It, it, and fluorine is not often used in biological molecules. Okay, we do have fluorine that's supposed to strengthen our teeth, but you have too much of it, and it's a poison. Okay, so, yep. This is beta, beta, and this is alpha helix. These, that's just descriptions of each of them. So you, alpha, alpha helix is this one. Beta pleated is this one. She's saying like the bullet points. The bullet points due to hydrogen bonding. Yeah, however you want to write them. Yeah. These are the two things that can happen in secondary structures. Now we're going to get into to tertiary and quaternary. Okay. Okay, so when we talk about a backbone, we're talking about the peptide chain with the, R, the R's are not included. Okay, so when we talk about a backbone of, of a peptide, we're looking at just S. The R's tell me what amino acid I have, right? Because everything else is the same. Okay, so then we get, so, so far we've talked about the primary structure and secondary structures. This is just another look at how you could put them together and different ways to look at it. And you can see different hydrogen bonding that's causing the pleated and the alpha helix. So then we go to a tertiary structure. A tertiary structure is a three-dimensional conformation of a polypeptide. Um, the common features of protein uh, tertiary structures reveal much about biological functions of proteins and their evol evolutionary origins. The function of a protein depends on its tertiary structure. If this is disrupted, it loses its activity. So 
if I take any of those, so you can see in that one on the on the right, it has both alpha helixes and pleated sheets in it, and it has some primary areas. So we've got inside a tertiary, we've got primary and secondary going on. Okay, so it is a mix to get going in the tertiary. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so on the tertiary, here's another look at it, how it can be working. Uh, the thing that's important here is on the right with the purple one, I really liked it showing you all the interactions. You have to know these. You have to know these. Okay, I put it in your thing so that you, you didn't have to write anything in, but you need to know these kind of interactions. So hydrophobic interactions, they'll, they'll, they don't want water. Um, hydrogen bondings, we talked about. Disulfide bridge, we haven't talked about in as far as the alpha helix or the pleated sheet, but they, those do happen. And an ionic bond will actually happen between some of the amino acids because some have a positive on the end and some have a negative. So that all helps to build the shape of a protein structure. So when I get tertiary, I've got a three-dimensional three dimensional shape that... Um, is stabilized by these R groups that are that are going together in there okay going forward so when we have hyd um, hydrophobic interactions um, these are things that do not like water they're usually towards the center of something like the lipid bilayer layer that we had we talked about was hydrophobic um, in order to have um, it be able to go in the body because the body is basically made up of water we have to have it have an outside that has a, a water that likes to get around so oftentimes the hydrophobic the the protein will wrap around the hydrophobic part and have the hydrophilic on the outside okay so it sort of protects it they put here like like a cage Okay, so then to break it down really quickly and to look at some things right here. Primary amino acid sequence, you just know it, done. Secondary, you've got an alpha helix or you've got a beta pleated sheet. Tertiary, you've got a three-dimensional structure of proteins. It can have a pleated sheet, it can have an alpha hot helix in it, it could have a primary section to it. Then we get to the quaternary and this is a 3D structure of proteins composed of multiple subunits. So, right. So each one of those could be a tertiary group. Okay. This is where you get to hem, where you start to uh, carry around the iron. Okay. You guys get this down, or you need to get it down. Are you okay? Subunits, like I said, would be like four tertiary things in there. So quaternary, you get big. So here's another, another way to look at it. So primary, you just got the chain. Secondary, you've got the alpha helix and the pleated sheet. Tertiary, now I'm mixing these alpha helix and pleated sheets and, and primary structures. But the quaternary, now I've got four of those for a hem all together. So I got four tertiaries together. Does that make sense? It just keeps big and getting bigger and bigger. It can be it can be four. Four is what we use for a hem, which will carry around um, a hem group will carry around your iron. A quadrinary can be four or more. Uh -huh. it's, it, it, I should say two or more tertiary because it, there are some that are smaller. Okay. These these are a hem that uh, iron basically thing. Okay, so going forward, we have um, proteins that we now, as we talk about proteins, we're going to classify them in several different ways. So we just classified it as far as um, what kind of structure it has. Okay, now we're going to do it on shape. So structure was how the molecules actually went together. Shape is what do they actually make when they, how, how do they come together. So we're going to talk about fibrous, globular, and membrane. Globular, yep. Yep. So let's talk about fibrous. And in your book on Stoker, it's on page um, 359. Um, 
And I sort of, I've sort of made this a little bit easier for you. So on fibrous, basically you're talking about it's water insoluble. It usually has a single type of secondary structure, pleated or alpha helix. Its structural functions have provided support for external protection. Okay, most abundant proteins in the body, the total mass present exceeds the total mass of any globular protein. Okay, now having said that, what do you think it is used for in the body? Not blood. Think about it. Protein is used for building parts of the body. What part of the body is fibrous? Muscle. So this is where your muscles come. So if you have a muscle tear, right, what's happened? Those fibers have started coming apart. Max would know about that, right? <laughs> okay. Don't go yet. Okay. I did simplify it down for you. The book gets a little bit crazy there. It's hard to take the three different types of heart. Oh, excuse me. We do, but I can't have one. Not until 6 o'clock tonight. Can we running till then? Oh yeah. I don't as much as I used to, but yeah, I do. It's a small class. I don't take big classes anymore. That's back breaking. Okay, are we okay to move forward? You guess. All right. So here we've got a muscle. So I sort of led you into this. Also collagen is uh, fibrous proteins. So in a muscle you have a myosin and an actin and we're going to talk about those two things and how they work together to actually get our muscles to contract. And collagen is what in older people if you'll notice they don't have as much collagen in their face and their, face, their skin starts to sag a little bit. They've got lots of collagen is what makes your skin elastic and, and um, helps hold form. So this is the best diagram that I could see that helped me understand actin and my, myosin. So myosin basically has these little fibers on the end and actin is like grabbing onto those fibers and pulling. Okay, so if I contract it, I pull it in like this. It's sort of like the, it reminded me of the Chinese, um, Chinese, what is it called? Finger, trap. finger, finger traps. traps, yeah. It reminded me of a Chinese finger trap, except that they're, it's straight. It doesn't have the cross links. But it, as you go in, it would release, and as you go out, it actually pulls. So as I go out and in, contracting and, and exercising, things like that move. Okay, so protein functions. Um, we've got a catalytic function. Enzymes are basically the catalyst, right, um, to catalyze um, things going on in your body. Um, with structural here, we're, t we're talking more about the collagen. Now, collagen um, is in tendons and ligaments and skins and cornea and cartilage and bone and blood vessel and gut. There's a lot of places that collagen is in the body. Um, it is what hold, helps you hold things together. So if you lose too much collagen, um, you actually get the, the um, droopy face, you, you have a hard time with um, keeping your bones from being brittle. Okay, so it sort of holds things together. It's like the glue. Okay, as we get down to another structure that's related to collagen, it's keratin. Keratin are bundled um, helixes, and I think you, they're over on this far side, you can see. Um, so they're actually like coiled ropes is the way that I could think of it, is what it looks like. Okay, and that's what your hair, your skin, your fingernails, that is the keratin. Okay, the outer layer, yeah. How do you get what? The split ends, that's it. You don't have enough of, of the disulfide binds that are holding it together. Heat, 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 heat burns it off. Breaks the disulfide bonds. 
chemicals can do it, chlorine, um, perms, and mm -hmm. yep. If you ever had, um, when we were little, we had perms all the time. You were breaking your disulfide bonds and reattaching them. That's how they get the perm. Yeah. <laughs> okay, going forward. Okay, so here we go. Yet what? Not this kind. Different kind. <laughs> That's a keratin with a C. This is keratin with a K. So this alpha keratin, um, or alpha helix keratin, you've got um, protofilament and probofiber. So you can sort of see how they go together. Like I said, the best way that I could even envision it in my mind is putting a rope together. I start with one strand and then I twist the other strand and, and hook them together because they're twisted opposite and they, they go together and then you can do another one and bring it and make more and more. And that's how you get your tendons and your other things going on. Yeah, yeah. That's the best way I can do it. Um, it's rich in hydrophobic amino acids. So hydrophobic means what? Hates water. So when you look at your hair and it gets wet, it's really not going into the hair to get wet, right? It's just wetting the outside. So nails, same thing. They're not going to all of a sudden get melty and fall off my body. You know, on skin, if I get it wet, it's not going to melt and wa wa wash off my body. That's things we want to make sure our water don't wa don't, don't af aren't affected by water. Okay? All right, so let's go forward. This is more of the collagen. Um, again, collagen, if you look at the little molecules, it, again, it reminds me of a rope. That's the best thing I can tell you there. It's a repeating tripeptide. So you've got a little break in between, but you'll notice... It sort of, to me, looks like a, uh, I don't know, a grid pattern, but there's a little break in between here that the peptides, they're, they're staggered so that they hang together, they, they hold together. Because if you didn't have that little air pocket moving, then your skin couldn't breathe kind of stuff, so you need that little air pocket. Okay, going forward, great tensile strength, Ugh. except when we hit something that's sharp, right? All right, then we go to globular. Globular is a total different um, thing. Globular will dissolve in water. So this is not something we want to have on the outside of our body. It is contained in seven, several, different, se uh, several kinds of secondary structures. It's involved in metabolic chemistry, performing functions such as catalyst, transport, and regulation. Um, its number and kind far exceed the number and kind of fibrose proteins. So it's not as numerous as the fibrous proteins, but it, there's a lot of different kinds. Okay? So it's like going to a candy store that carries only candy canes, but there's lots of different kinds. Does that make sense? No. Bad analogy. Okay. It's like going to Cracker Barrel. And they only have one kind of candy that's different kinds. I don't know. <laughs> Never been to Cracker Barrel? They have all the old-fashioned old fashioned candies. That they, they still have the, those fizz, the ones that you put in your mouth and they fizz all over. Oh, like the Zots, 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 yeah. No, no, they're little hard candies and you get to the I center and it goes... And they've got the old-fashioned hard cat taffy that's this big, and you hit it, and you get little pieces, yeah. Best place to get old-fashioned candy. Wait, sorry. Uh, uh, uh. We okay to move forward? There's more than you that were writing. I just was moving forward because I was bored. I'm done with this slide. Let's move forward. Okay. Moving forward. So this is a globular protein, Okay. Proteins usually have a spherical shape because they're usually transported in the blood or in bodily fluids. Um, the chains are usually folded, so the hydrophobic is in the center and hydrophilic on the outside. Um, they got to be soluble in water. They got to be able to move things. That's why they're transport. That's where we get our hemoglobin and myoglobin um, to embed on these kind of things. Transporting. It moves things around inside the body. It is water soluble, so it will move in fluids. So I can move stuff with fluids. Okay, that's the globular proteins. That's its main purpose. 
Okay, other functions of, of globular proteins is they protect against disease. Um, this is where we get our antibodies that can combat bacteria and viruses. Okay, they're globular pro proteins. Okay. They're protective proteins. Myoglobin and hemoglobin. These are the first pro uh, protein structures determined. They are their oxygen carriers. And hemoglobin transports oxygen from the lungs to tissues. And myoglobin um, does oxygen storage protein. They're both with oxygen. Hemoglobin transports it. Myoglobin stores it. should be. Okay, I'm just going to go one, maybe two more slides. I'm going to call it good for today. Okay. Um, so when we look at prosthetic groups, prosthetic groups are things that now, if you're looking like at going into biotech or biotechnology, they take and they splice out a piece of the gene and they put in something else. So for instance, they're looking at trying to fix different genetic mutations that might have taken place. So they, they take out a, a slice of, of DNA and they put it in a new place. This they do with a protein. So if I have a problem with a protein, um, this is a possibility for something that might help diabetics because we need something that will produce insulin, right? We don't want to have to keep shooting ourselves with insulin. We want something to help produce insulin. And if we have a protein that helps adjust that, that would be great. So native is what was there to start with, artificial or prosthetic, like a, you know, prosthetic limb. It's artificial. We put it in there. Splicing. It's splicing, yeah. Okay, so when we talk about a subunit, this is a polypeptide chain having a primary, secondary, and tertiary structure feature that is part of the larger protein. So when you're asking me before when what is a subunit, it's basically what we would call the tertiary, because it has all of that together. So here we have a red blood cell and the hemoglobin molecule that's carrying around all that fun stuff. We've got an alpha chain, a, a beta chain, another alpha, a beta chain, another alpha chain. We've got an iron that's being carried around, which is a hem group. Um, over here, I thought this was sort of interesting quaternary structures. I'm going to move this up. Um, we've got insulin right here. Look at that. That's a big big globular thing. We got silk. It looks more to me like um, graphite. Remember what graphite looked like? That's more like what silk looks like. And collagen is just sort of there. Okay, I'm going to do one more. That's where a good place to stop. Okay, so we're going to stop right here for classification because that goes into a different kind of way to classify proteins. You got to know all these different ones. Okay, so we're going to take time. We're going to do our homework and Call it good for today.